I'm just going to say a couple of things just about monotheism again. I mean, I know I've covered some of this before, but the, the attempt uh, with, with uh, monotheism was to help human beings who have strong in-group, out-group kind of biases. You know, part of the intent of that is to help us see the human in others, whether they have a different culture or religion or dress differently or eat differently, have a different culture. It's about helping us recognize one another as human beings and to understand the value and worth of every human being. Um, and, uh, and, and so th that's you know, part of what monotheism is trying to say. So if we were to try to say that in a less religious way, we might say that all human beings have inalienable rights, right? And that uh, all human beings deserve to have freedom of speech and uh, freedom of religion and uh, equal protection under the law, um, those, those kinds of things. So um, in a lot of ways, uh, there's, there's been a lot of reflection about the development of human rights in the world and how many major traditions, not just the Abrahamic ones, have contributed the sense of the worth and value of every human being. And to help us kind of recognize that part of the important part of being human is recognizing the value of, of, of other human beings, um, even though sometimes fear can overtake us. So that's just that's just one piece about the monotheism thing that I want, want to say. And I, I also want to say for, for my own part that um, it's kind of overlooked in the Christian scriptures how Jesus engaged with people, a Syrophoenician woman, he engaged with, with Romans, he engaged with, uh, with, with Samaritans, with whom uh, his own people had racial and religious differences. And he was able to recognize the validity and the, the beauty of their spirituality and also realize a lot of the commonalities and the differences that, that he had with them. But he was still willing to stand with them among his own people in a way that helped uh, other folk around him to recognize the humanity of Samaritans. That, and, and that's what that whole story about the Good Samaritans about. It's about Jesus in a certain context lifting up a positive story about his, uh, his Samaritan uh, neighbors. So that's, that's what that's all about there. So next I wanna take you through uh, a little bit of messaging about how you can, you can talk to somebody who is fearful. Uh, just a few words about being an ally first. So last week I talked about how allies are, are part of an in-group. There's also some, some out groups or some other groups that, that are out there. And what they do is they kind of move in the space between the two groups. They stay part of their in-group and they also relate to people in some kind of feared uh, out group. And what this can do over time is to help the two groups get to know each other, recognize commonalities, and also recognize that they still have differences, which is just fine. Uh, another thing that allies do is within their own in-group, they create space for people who are members of that out group so that the group can get to know folks. And of course, once people get to know each other, they start to, to realize, oh, wow, you know, we're not so different. Oh, wow. Those, you know, the, the people who are part of that out group that I feared, like I don't need to fear them. And that really begins to change uh, the, the whole dynamic. So part of what allies can do is to create space within our in-group. Uh, but allies can also do something else, which is really important right now, especially you know, for our Asian American sisters and brothers, is uh, when they come under pressure, when there's some kind of tragedy or something that's going on, um, what, pe what people who are allies can do is help stand behind uh, a community that's being put under pressure in some way. So we can stand behind so that other people will listen to their voice, so people will listen to their microphone, so that when the picture is taken of the event, where a minority community is under pressure that like, you know, folk know that there's other people with them. And that's a really important part of what allyship is. If you wanna know more about that uh, allyship, you can, uh, you can join our, our PATHS network. Actually tonight, we're starting our first course on the practice of authentic allyship and that's at the pathsnetwork.org. Okay, end of commercial. So when someone comes to you and they're experiencing some real fear, grief, pain around another group, you know, what can you do? And the first thing is, of course, remember the power of pain, the power of fear, excuse me, that fear can like overwhelm us, it can shut down our brain to some degree. And so what we encourage you to do is just honor their emotion, but meet the emotion, not the myth. So don't repeat the negative stuff they say, don't try to counter it right away, just 
help them recognize how they're feeling, okay? Just be a human being with them. Uh, number two, sometimes you got to reframe the conversation. And remember that uh, River Richard Nixon, you know, famously said, well, I'm not a crook, right? Remember when he said that? And so what that did was kind of actually the opposite of what he intended, because the human brain is based more on association than it is based on logic. <laughs> So when he said, I'm not a crook, he cemented like the whole crook thing with himself, which was not very helpful. And so um, we, we got to really make sure that we're not like reinforcing negative stereotypes and biases and fears uh, when we're trying to talk with folk. And so we have to kind of reframe the issue about like, say, basic human rights or something like that. And we'll get more into some messages in a moment. Next is you really want to listen for some shared values. So if it's a person who happened to serve in the military, well, pay attention to that because they probably love their country, right? And so you can build on some shared values, values that, that you share with them and values that American Muslims share with them. You can also build on other common American you know, constitutional values, uh, some of that kind of thing. And if there's none of that, build on a shared interest, right? Um, so next, tell a positive humanizing story. And, and I, I'm actually gonna, gonna be, be real clear here for a minute. So I was once talking to a guy named Charles who raised three powerful daughters and cared for his wife as she had Alzheimer's. And he came up to me one day and he was so angry. He was so red in the face like about Islam and women. And, uh, and so um, I was able to, to hear his, his fear and his anger um, but was also able to share with him that Islam offered a package of, of rights for women that were unparalleled until just recently, and still in parts of the world are not, are not uh, there. And, um, and over the course of the conversation, I could see him like be less red in the face. And, and after a while, he was able to hear that like, oh, okay, like maybe my news sources aren't helping me to understand the real reality here. And that's the kind of thing that we can achieve in these kind of conversations. Um, and part of the way I did that was by telling a positive humanizing story. And in the, in the Abrahamic traditions, uh, it says, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's the eighth commandment uh, for Lutherans. And the whole point there is that when we bear false witness about a group, it actually tears away at human community and builds violence. Again, the kind of thing we're seeing against our Asian American siblings today. And so tell a specific story. If you don't know a Muslim yourself, then, then pick someone who's kind of public, like Shaquille O'Neal or Muhammad Ali or someone that you really appreciate um, and the kind of contributions that they make to our larger culture. And that's the thing that really matters right there because that story is gonna resonate with them and help to cut through some of the, the vast amount of negative news, because we only hear the negative news about each other, right? I mean, we don't always hear the positive news about people in smaller towns until something bad happens. We don't hear positive stories about hardly anybody. And so when you tell that positive story, it really begins to shift. And then you might want to learn a few positive uh, facts and data about American Muslims or whatever other group is being dehumanized. Then you don't have to know all this all at once. You can have a conversation over time with people. But uh, the, you know, Pew has some really great resources, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, the Council on American Islamic Relations, all have a lot of, of, uh, of really good um, data that you can share with people. And then lastly, uh, continue the conversation with people. So human beings change slowly. You know, I mean, if and, and don't, by the way, take on anybody as a project and make them try to make them change like that's that doesn't work. And it's kind of manipulative, you know, honestly. So uh, just continue the conversation with people and give them the time. And remember that most of the change that goes on in people happens after the conversation's over, as they're doing their work and walking around, they'll resonate with that story. But you might invite them to continue the conversation as kind of a journey with you. And one of the things I like to do is to say to people, look, I used to have a lot of, of anti-Muslim bigotry in me. In fact, I still do because I live in a larger culture where there's a lot of it. And so, you know, don't, don't take on this holier than thou, you've got it all figured out attitude, but really let's do some discovery together 
about American Muslims. And so that might involve meeting with one, uh, that might involve going to a mosque visit, that might mean, you know, kind of getting together with a local pastor and an imam and having a conversation about commonalities and differences. So all of that is part of continuing that conversation. I think I shared a few weeks ago that I've had some conversation with family members, you know, who were really pretty negative about what I'm doing. But over the last three or four years, you know, the conversations kind of shifted a bit because I respected them enough, you know, to let them believe what they want to believe. But I also pushed back a bit and continued a conversation over time. So some messages that seem to work, um, and these have been tested uh, all by, by by pretty intensive studying, that our country was founded on the principle of freedom of religion. And we do not tell people how to pray and do not ban people based on their choice of religion or no religion. That message works with most Americans because they really hold that as a fundamental value. Um, no one should fear for their safety because of the color of their skin, what language they speak or how they pray. We need more acceptance and love and less fear. So in response to some question about fear and violence, like this is a great message and it works extremely well because we all, like I think, believe it. Another one is we are stronger when we all come together as Americans and weaker when we lack understanding and let lack of understanding come between us. United we stand, divided we fall. Again, a message that most of us believe. We, a few others that I've learned working with Sister Anila, honestly, who's taught me a lot, uh, so, so very much. Um, we should learn from people directly from them and not about them from third parties. This is extremely important, you know, that a basic sense of respect that all of us would hope for. And then lastly, it is wrong to apply collective blame to a community for the acts of individuals. That is just not fair because all of us are part of groups at some point that have done some things wrong. <laughs> and would we wanna be blamed uh, for all of that? I think the answer is no. Uh, 